Okay, new government and society, the Bill of Rights. First 10 amendments to the Constitution added in 1791, they guarantee our rights, written by Madison, who wrote them because he wanted to make sure they weren't too restrictive. So that's why they're written kind of loosely. Does the right to bear arms, because we, in order to provide a well-ordered militia, the people have the right to bear arms, mean that everybody can own any gun they want? Yes. Does it mean that the government can say, you can only own a gun if you're part of the militia, meaning the National Guard? Does freedom of expression mean that you can say whatever you want, whenever you want? Or does it mean that you're limited by your speech? Okay. Does it mean you can burn the flag or not? I, I, you know, these are all issues that the courts have wrestled with for 200 and some years. And they'll probably wrestle with them for another 200 years. Which brings us to loose interpretation and, and per, or construction versus strict. Okay? Loose interpreters were the Federalists. The strict interpreters became, were called Democratic Republicans, and they called themselves Republicans because democracy to them meant mob rule. Okay, so it sounded too chaotic. Loose interpretation would be that you would say that the Constitution gives us all the right to own a gun because it says so the people have the right to bear arms. Strict interpretation would be that you can only own a gun if you are part of a militia, meaning the National Guard, or your, your policeman, okay? That's an example. Any questions on those two terms? Which did not happen during Washington's administration. They had things like the Embargo Act, um, Neutrality Proclamation, um, Establishment of the National Bank, the Whiskey Rebellion, okay, the answer is the Embargo Act. It's one of those questions you either know it or you don't. The Embargo Act is associated with what president? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, excellent. Okay, Hamilton's financial plan. Were state debts to be assumed? Yes. Was there to be a national bank? Yes. Was the government supposed to protect industry? Yes. Hamilton wanted to get rid of a country of farmers. He wanted a nation of a mixed economy. Not get rid of all farmers, but have people be businessmen too, run factories, etc. The first factory in America was set up in 1792 or three by Samuel Slater. And it was a textile mill. In general, we don't talk about a lot of industrialization in America until during or after what war? The War of 1812. When it shows that we're woefully not self-prepared or self-sufficient. <coughs> Hamilton's plan favored, did it favor state bankers, eastern merchants, farmers, or plantation owners? Eastern merchants. Eastern merchants, whoever said that. Okay. State bankers, not so much, because they were controlled by the National Bank eventually. Farmers never. Hamilton didn't like farmers. Plantation owners would have been okay with him just because they were rich, and he favored the rich. The National Bank, the purpose of it. First, it was to serve as a place to deposit government money and to pay, and to pay out government bills. But most importantly, its purpose was to make rich people invest in the government. Because remember that two-fifths, no, two, yeah, okay, how do I want to say this? Two-fifths of the deposits of the National Bank were owned by the U.S. government. The other three-fifths were owned by you, the people, okay? I don't have any money, so I can't buy shares in the National Bank. Zoe, on the other hand, has a ton of money. She can afford to buy shares in the National Bank. What's wrong with that, according to the opponents of the bank? Zoe will end up with more power or influence in government than I will because she wants to protect her interests. So if Congress is going to pass a bill that somehow threatens her interest in the bank, her money in the bank, 
she's going to be lobbying Congress to change that law, get rid of it, whatever. Okay? Are they going to listen to Zoe or are they going to listen to me? Probably to Zoe because she does, in fact, have the money. That's eventually why Jackson killed off the bank. I mean, that's one of his reasons, is because people who invested in the bank had undue privilege and pressure on the government, that kind of thing. Jefferson was opposed to it because of that. He was also opposed because of strict interpretation. According to Jefferson, there should be no national bank because nowhere in the Constitution does it say national bank. Alexander Hamilton, who was a loose interpreter, his answer was, but it gives Congress the right to do whatever is necessary to run the country. It's necessary to have a bank to run the country. That's loose interpretation. Okay? Um, revenue sources with Hamilton's plan. Were there excise taxes? Hmm, do we forget what excise taxes are? Excise taxes are a nice word for luxury taxes, where we tax items that are considered luxuries. And were there excise taxes under Hamilton's? Yes, the most famous was the whiskey tax. Whiskey tax, excellent. Whiskey tax. Were there income taxes in Hamilton's plan? No. We don't see income. The first time we see an income tax in American history is during the Civil War. It only lasts for during the Civil War, and they try to impose it again in the 1890s. The Supreme Court overrules it. So what do they do? They add an amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees the right of the government to tax our income. Okay, it's one of those progressive amendments, 16 through 19. It's either 16 or 17. I want to say 16, but you'd have to look that up yourself. Were there protective tariffs? Yes. Because Hamilton wanted Americans to begin setting up industry, so he wanted protective tariffs to, as a way to raise money for the government, but more importantly as a way to encourage you to set up your own textile mill rather than buying British cloth, okay? Because he realized that when you first set up your textile mill at Samuel Slater, it was going to cost you more to produce your cloth than the big textile mills in England. The Whiskey Rebellion. So, Congress imposes the whiskey tax. To Western farmers, those people who lived like in Western Pennsylvania where the Whiskey Rebellion took place, whiskey was not a luxury. It was a way that they made money. So they took that 20 grains or 20 bushels of grain, specifically rye usually, and converted it into 10 gallons of whiskey. For them, for you as a farmer in Western Pennsylvania to get from Western Pennsylvania to Philadelphia to sell your crops so you could make money to buy what you needed, to transport 20-some bushels of grain would have taken several mules. To transport a 10-gallon jar, a jug of whiskey took one mule. In fact, that one mule could actually transport several 10-gallon jugs of whiskey. So when they are charging a high tax on a gallon of whiskey, the tax was 7 cents a gallon, and whiskey tended to sell for 25 cents a gallon. That really hurt that small farmer. Did it hurt the big whiskey distiller? Heck no, because they already produced enough. So farmers in western Pennsylvania revolted. Washington's response was to send out the troops to stop the rebellion. Okay? Hamilton went at the head of the troops because he wanted to string them all up by the nearest tree and hang them. Washington eventually pardoned everybody who was even arrested because his thing was, the point is, if you have a beef with the government, it's no longer acceptable, no longer acceptable to revolt. Now you have to go through the channels. You have to go to your legislator and say, get rid of this whiskey tax. Okay? 